sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Jason from Goalie Monkey bringing you our very first episode of the Outer Roll podcast. We got a great interview with Team USA goaltender Nicole Hensley. And before we get into that, we're here with Jason Feltz, our producer. Hey, Grayson, what's going on, buddy? How's it going? Hey, good, man. I'm excited to uh, talk some goalie talk as a non-hockey goalie. Yeah, uh, so for people who don't know Jason or haven't listened to the other podcasts, Jason used to be the lacrosse uh, social media runner before he moved into the manager position. Now he's our producer for the uh podcast yeah trying to uh trying to learn all of the sports goalie has been that really all the ice side of everything lacrosse is so laid back with gear and launches and stuff like that that seeing the the hockey side and the goalie side is crazy to me so it's been cool and i'm excited to get to do you know be doing this podcast finally and actually talk about this stuff and then learn more about it through interviews and stuff so excited to be here (laughs) yeah i'm happy to have you here it's it's really cool to have someone who you know, isn't exactly so deep into goaltending. So sure. if I don't think about any of the questions uh, that like a goalie would think of, so someone who doesn't play goalie mm-hmm. can ask a question that wouldn't pop up into my head or another goaltender's head. Mm-hmm. So before we go into Nicole's interview, I know you listened to it recently. Do you have any questions about it? Oh, uh, no. I mean, I think it was a great interview. Um, definitely cool to obviously get to talk to like a member of Team USA yeah. and, and an Olympian and all that stuff is awesome. But there, there's a couple things I noticed. Well, one thing and the topic I kind of want to bring up to you that she brought up is the recruiting aspect of it. And I mean, lacrosse has goalies too. And I guess this is something that just never really crossed my mind. But like, you're not going to go to a school that has two goalies already or three goalies already and even juniors teams and stuff. So I'm kind of curious to hear from you, like having had that junior experience and stuff like I imagine recruiting for something that's so specialized, like a goalie position or like I think Nicole called it an individualized aspect of a team sport. Yeah. Uh, just has to be brutal. Yeah. I didn't have to deal with the college side of things. And I feel like that's a lot more timing based. You don't want to go into a college with a with a sophomore goalie mm-hmm. the next year. Sure. You don't want to come in as a freshman with one person who's a year above you and just hope you're better than them by by the time you're a junior. Because if they're if they're the promising goalie for that school, then you can't really move in front. So you're just kind of bagging along until you're a senior and mm-hmm. you don't have want to have one year where you're you're the starter. Right. You want to have up to at least two, if not three. And uh, she actually mentions it, I believe, in her uh, interview that she was lucky enough to get a start as a freshman because of an injury. Mm-hmm. And then it just kind of snowballed from there because she was just so talented early on. And that's the ideal situation. But for juniors, I remember uh, you know, calling teams. And they're like, yeah, we already have two goalies. And that's an immediate no. Right. And then going into another team, they're like, oh, we have one pretty good goalie. And you're like, I don't want to split time all that much. But if I have to, I do. It all depends on where you want to go. You know, if I want to, if I want to go to a better team that's going to win a lot and then play, you know, twenty games out mm-hmm. of the forty-five. Well, so I'm curious too. Like, obviously, yeah, you want to find the perfect, you know, location, and everything apart from yeah. just the team. But so I'm, I'm not completely novice to hockey. I announce for for a local junior team as well, so I know enough. But I feel like there's so much turnaround in juniors too that it's like. Yeah, you're almost wanting to find like, okay, what coach do I work well with? Yeah. What like location do I want to be in? What billet families are good for me? More so than because I mean, you could go to a team with two phenomenal goalies and they're gone by the end of the next week, you know. So is that something that you have to factor into, or is it just like you have to assume that a guy's going to be there for an entire season or two years or age or whatever? Yeah, it it all depends on what level you're at because you can be at the top level of tier three mm-hmm. and then. If tier two teams are looking, you're that goalie could disappear in like a week, you know? Right. It's so fast, and yeah. there's so much junior. I mean, you could play anywhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It that's it's something that you kind of have to put into a factor. Like when I went into juniors, there was four goalies on my team, and I was sitting at like the four four position, mm-hmm. if not three, like mostly towards the four, where I was just like, I'm here because this team's really good, and I'm just gonna like. I'm here for training, if, yep. if anything. And after a while, I was getting I was getting the itch to, like, I want to play a game. So I remember making that decision, talking to my coaches and saying, like, hey, I'm not playing any here, so I'm, I want to try a different team. And so they hooked me up with the team I ended up going to, and within, 
think it was five days. I was I went from Minnesota to Colorado. It was five days. Which, was when, when was this? How old were you? I was 19, I think, or like 18. See, okay, that's maybe a little bit better, but I can't like... What it's like a 16-year-old, like exactly. some kid from like, Europe. Exactly. Like, that, that's something that blows my mind yep. is some kid who's 16 years old comes over from you know check speaks broken english yeah, like in it, a completely new place it's crazy to me yeah i yeah. it's it's crazy i i um we had a swedish guy up in minnesota that i remember it was like his first time in america like mm-hmm. that was it and so it's like crazy seeing that and if he was to leave the team and go somewhere else i don't know what i would do because i had all these different connections to like talk back and forth but oh yeah it's i it's guess you think weird. too like because i try to pick, like put myself in that mindset and I mean man if you're if you're coming from Sweden say and you go to Duluth Minnesota like yeah. if they ship you out to Dallas Texas like okay it's a little bit warmer but like you're still in a place you don't know you know it's not like you're, yeah. you're going from one thing that you got super super comfortable with but no I think that's so crazy when when there's transactions and stuff at such a young age and I guess it just looks so good on a hockey resume to come play in the states that like oh you're in El Paso okay whatever like you played in the States and then you go home and kill it professionally like that that's a, a world that yeah, exactly. is almost unfathomable my, to me my brother has told me stories about some of the kids who came over here and played with him mm-hmm. and he was like yeah they were pretty good here like they weren't anything like special like second line uh, tier three and now they're back playing pro in Sweden it's yeah. he was like I can't imagine what that's like <laughs> just going back and just having the experience and having the resume that's what it's all about mm-hmm. yeah which i guess i mean that's usually make the case for anything it's just crazy it's such an international sport that's the uh, fourth biggest in the united states maybe yeah, is such a destination say. like you think i don't know i can't can't think of any other sport that that would really be the case that's a non-centralized sport in the u.s that is become makes it such a coveted place. Maybe like basketball, maybe soccer. I feel like is the only one you can really think. Well, about even then, like you, I feel like you'd you'd stay in Europe. You'd go play Super League, or you'd go to England or something. Exactly. Like, I, maybe the training is edu- that much better. It's an educational thing at I, that point. Yeah. Like it's, you know, uh, yeah. But yeah, it's, going back to the original way. point of all of this is, it's a lot of timing. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of knowing who's in front of you, who's behind you what your opportunities are and it's a lot of luck honestly that's, yeah that's why you know, the next point was gonna be yeah, it's, it's thinking, luck and hoping something bounces your way yeah like thinking back to my personal career is uh you know thinking back like if one different thing happened if i was to make a different decision like there's so many people i wouldn't have met there's so many experiences i mm-hmm. wouldn't have had and i'm kind of glad with the way mine went you know like thinking back i'm not one to regret things i'm not gonna be like oh i wish i went and did this i try not to be like that but it's all about timing it's all about luck it's all about everything is different Mm -hmm. everything's a factor and you can just do your research and hope for the best yeah that's deep yeah (laughs) (laughs) it really is and then i had another just since we are a uh, a company that sells gear um goalymonkey.com check it out (laughs) so nicole talks about she likes shorter pads and I've underst I've starting to understand a little bit better kind of sizing and things and you've got yeah. you add on for thyroid and stuff like that, but how much does a does your pads or, or your equipment like affect how you are as a goaltender? I feel like if you're if you've got quick hands, you've got quick hands, you know? Yeah. I'm sure weight obviously goes into it, but I'm curious from someone that does it. Yeah. How it's much that uh changes. there's a lot of factors that go into every pad, you know, is the pad stiff, is the pad soft? You know, how tall is it? How does it fit on me? How is this going to react for shots? It, it all depends on who you are and what you do. But her whole point of using a smaller pad is for, you know, I'd rather sacrifice this a little bit that I can keep my knees wider. And when I'm down in the butterfly, I cover like a little bit more for I'm going to get there faster. Mm-hmm. And she's she's five six, So she needs every bit of speed that she can get and knowing the coach that she worked under for so long it's all about efficiency that's one of his three e's that's his thing is three e goaltending mm-hmm. is is efficiency you know how efficient can i get from this point of the ice to the other because when you break it down goaltending you're only covering like you know six feet like 10 at very most like left to right sure and you know you're only covering the net but it's how efficient can you cover that net? Mm-hmm. So using the smaller pads I've picked up is a lot better because I can keep everything together for movement. You know, 
pushing your knees together so they're not too far apart, having your legs far apart, it mm-hmm. makes you, you know, you get stuck. So having everything closer together and you're exploding out instead of bringing everything back in together all the time is efficient for everything. Mm-hmm. So going off of that, I know that you know Nicole. This wasn't just yeah. a lucky interview. So talk a little bit about how you've uh, come to know her. So a long time ago, and actually one of our next interviews, I talked to Ev from Vaughn about how I met him at a at the uh, at a goalie camp, which I also met the goalie coach Luke also at this goalie camp, and I ended up going to him for private lessons in St. Louis, and so that's kind of how. I met her originally is from his Instagram page. (laughs) And so I just remember like seeing her all the time, like before she went to USA and everything, Mm -hmm. she was finishing up a Lindenwood, I think around that time. And I remember, um, messaging, messaging her on Instagram being like, Hey, I'm coming into St. Louis. Like, I know you're going to be around. Like, do you want to train at some point? And she said, yeah, she was being really nice about it. And so I got, kind of my first big experience with a uh, with a goalie coach with a future Team USA goalie. She had just gotten like her Team USA stuff. So it was it was a cool experience for me. Like that's when I first met her and we kind of kept in touch like here and there, like not too close, but just, you know, chatting here and there mm-hmm. and like about goaltending and kind of everything that was going on. And then I've, I've gone back to Luke every year since then. And she's just she's been in like worlds or anything else like at every other time so i haven't seen her since then Mm -hmm. but that was kind of our initial start was through luke okay yeah understood um cool so i'll let you kind of roll into the interview give us a little uh kind of who nicole is and i know she's a true ambassador which we've got some exciting new true product uh coming out as well if you want to take it away with that stuff yeah, uh, just before we get into some of the things about Nicole, the uh, the true AX9 and AX5 are coming out actually this Friday when this is actually released. It'll they'll, they'll be out this day, and uh, just a little tagline from True is uh, the AX9 is optimized for enhanced power and balance for faster load times and quicker passes. So you might think like you know that's that's, that's just a generic tagline, but having them here uh, at our warehouse and going down and looking at them. These things are as light as can be. And so I'm, I'm very excited to be able to use them on the ice very soon here. And I'm I'm excited for the true AX9 and AX5. They're sweet, too. I checked them out as, as a non-goalie. They're aesthetically pleasing. Yeah, so. they're, they're very cool. <laughs> yeah. They have this, like, dark navy tone to them on the uh, on the carbon. It looks sweet. But that, that true blue that they use is, is sweet as well. That's yeah. just, just a little shout-out there. <laughs> yeah. And then... Uh, so Nicole, some of her little background uh, that I'd like to go into is she went to Lindenwood, and for anyone who doesn't know what Lindenwood is, is they're a they're a private college that uh, they compete with teams like Wisconsin in their division. So they have a very tough uh, very tough division to play in because you know if you're gonna if you're a women uh, women's player going into college, you know am I gonna go to Lindenwood or am I gonna go to like Minnesota? Or am I gonna go to Wisconsin? You're you're gonna pick the other two. So I I remember talking to her about it a little bit, how they were struggling throughout the years. And you know, they're not winning many games. So as a goaltender, you're just doing everything that mm-hmm. you can. Yeah, she mentioned at one point uh ninety saves in a yeah. game, I think, against Ohio State at one point yeah. in the interview. It's it's crazy. It's, it's like you can only do so much. So one of her biggest stats that I, I uh saw was she held the NCA uh, career save record with 4,094 oh my God. <laughs> throughout her career, <laughs> which actually was just broken. And I think the new oh, record's wow. like 4,200. It was actually set this past year. So that was just a little mark that I thought was amazing. Like, that's that's so much. That'll get you to Team USA. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then uh, she also had two world championship golds uh, over the past uh, three years. And then in 2018... She was an Olympic gold medalist in Pyeongchang. Cool. So let's check out the interview with uh, Team USA goaltender and true ambassador, Nicole Hensley. Starting off, we're going to talk about your hockey career. Just kind of tell us about some inspirations for you growing up and then kind of going through youth hockey. Yeah. So for me, growing up in Colorado, uh, my neighbor across the street actually played ice hockey. Um, We were both, uh, I think, seven years old. And uh, he was always out in the street on his rollerblades, you know, 
um, shooting pucks into their into their net. And, and one day um, he asked if I wanted to play, and it just kind of went from there. We were always outside playing, and then uh, eventually his parents came over and and asked if um, they'd let me try for real on ice and kind of just blossomed from there so I, I started as a player and on that team they kind of passed the pads around you know if you wanted you wanted to try give goalie a try you could and so towards the end of the year it was my turn and kind of just jumped in and and really enjoyed it and had a good time and uh so from there I, I kept being a skater and I was kind of like our, always our team's like backup goaltender and um and then eventually that led into um when I was a sport Word age, I did half and half uh, for a season, and then um, going into Pee Wee's, uh, they kind of told me I needed to choose if I was going to be a goalie or a player, and my mom had kind of said, if you're going to be a player, you you have to go play with the girls, because the boys uh, at that time started hitting in Pee Wee's, um, so she said, you know, if you're going to be a skater, we're going to switch over and start playing with the girls, but if you play goalie, you continue playing with the boys, and um, you know, those guys were, were some of my best friends, so it was a really easy decision. I was like, yep, I'm going to be a goalie then, stick with the boys. So I played boys hockey all the way up through my sophomore year of high school. So my last year was midget minor, um, double A, and um, uh, still really good friends with, with some of those guys I grew up with, um, really good family friends with them as well. So, um, But in order to kind of be, be seen on the on the girls' side by college coaches, you really do have to play on a, especially in Colorado, you got to play on a team that's, that's going to travel to those those big tournaments where where scouts are and everything. So um, I switched over to start playing for the Colorado Select U19 uh, AAA team. And um, I had two awesome years with them, uh, so much fun. We had a great coach that really pushed us and, and prepared us to play at the D1 or at the college level, be it D1 or D3, and uh, uh, made some really, really good friends there as well. And that was kind of the recruiting process for me was a little bit tough. I think people don't – the recruiting process is tough on anybody, but I think it's especially tough on goaltenders because, you know, every year every single team needs a forward or a D, but, you know, not everybody always needs a goaltender. So it can get, um, it can get a little rough uh, some of those – I had a ton of phone calls with, with D1 coaches just saying I didn't fit, I wasn't tall enough, I wasn't fast enough, or they didn't need a goaltender, or they were already talking to somebody in my ear. Um, so I actually ended up getting a little bit of anxiety uh, to even answer my phone at that point because uh, <laughs> things were just going so poorly. And, and I went in and had a meeting with, with my coach uh, at the time, kind of, she was seeing where I was at in the college recruiting process, and I was like, "Well, I'm probably gonna go play for for this deep preschool." And she said, uh, "No, that's that's not what we're gonna do." And it was like, "You're a D D1 goaltender. I know you can play there. I'm I'm gonna find you a home." And I was like, "All right, good good luck. I hope you you have an easier time than I did. Mm-hmm. I did talking to all these coaches, and that was kind of when uh, Lindenwood came to the table and." Uh, I went out for a visit uh, in St. Charles and really liked the school. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, uh, the kind of older campus, they're still building from like 1827, and, and it's really, really pretty campus. And so I really liked it. And I, I ended up committing around April of my senior year. So I was extremely, extremely late in my commitment. Um, but uh, I went in there my, my freshman year and uh, – there were two sophomores ahead of me and I kind of expected to, um, you know, kind of be a backup and have to really work my, work my butt off to, to earn a starting spot or even just any playing time at all, really. And, um, the week before our first game, my freshman year, our goaltender, our starter took a shot off the collarbone and ended up uh, breaking her collarbone. And so she couldn't, she couldn't play that next weekend and so they were kind of like looked at me and they were like well uh, you're you're in and um so our first games were against Ohio State um at Ohio State so you know playing a big school like that was kind of kind of intimidating out of the gate for your first games but um we ended up losing uh like four nothing and six one or something like that but um I saw over 100 shots that weekend um made like 50 against each game and so I ended up actually playing pretty well and uh, was fortunate enough to kind of continue that through um, through the entire year. And from there, I um, kind of took over that, that starting position. And, 
the end of the year, we were playing Robert Morris University in, in the playoffs. Um, our, our league, the or College Hockey America, our conference does, um, did a, a best of three elimination series at the time for playoffs. And so we're at Robert Morris and their assistant coach at the time is, uh, Bree McLaughlin, who's a two time Olympian with the U.S. team. And, um, uh, we're playing them, and our first game goes into triple overtime. Uh, we end up losing 2-1, to one, but I had 92 shots on goal, and so 90 saves. And um, I was really fortunate that Bree was in the building because she made some phone calls to the coaches with uh, Team USA, and they were like, hey, um, we've got a kid here I think I think we need to give a look, give a look to, and, and from there, that was when I first got invited to um, some USA camp which was a really cool experience kind of even just putting on a U.S. practice jersey for the for the first time was was a pretty humbling experience and kind of look around the room and you're with uh Hillary Knight and uh you know Megan Duggan the Lambert twins you know some huge names in there and then of course uh Alex Rigby Jesse Vetter Molly Schaus and and Brie McLaughlin all all sitting next to you in the locker room is is a really cool cool feeling and very humbling feeling and it was great to, to kind of be able to learn from them um and then kind of got invited to camp uh till my junior year I made my first uh USA team which was a or a select team which was a U22 team um got to put on the US jersey for the first time and, and play a game against uh the Canadian U22 team which was pretty cool cool experience we, we ended up winning in a shootout so it was a lot of fun and and, you know, I was just happy to kind of be there. From there, I made the U22 team again the next year and, and got to start two games. So kind of started working my way up the ladder, I guess, in that way. And then that spring in 2016, I made uh, the women's world team um, with uh, Jesse Vetter and Alex Rigby. So uh, that was pretty cool to get to spend, you know, almost a month with, with those two and, and just learning from them how they – um, handle playing on such a big stage and and uh, how they carry themselves was was really cool and um, was fortunate enough to get to play Russia in the in the round robin of that tournament and uh, we won nine nothing I think so uh, the team played really well and it, it was a lot of fun and we ended up winning uh, the championship that year so it was really cool to just you know I was just really happy to to be in the same room with all those people and and. Uh, win a world championship and from there uh kind of went on and uh continued training so at that point I graduated so I was training and then I was an assistant coach at Lindenwood uh my first year out of school and competed in the four nations tournament in the fall with the U.S. and then uh in that that spring was the 2017 Worlds, which was um in Michigan actually and um uh, I got to start that tournament, so I played two games against, or I played the round robin game against Canada and the and the championship game against Canada, and that went into overtime as well. Uh, and then uh, Hillary Knight scored a unreal shot, went far down um, on a on a rush with uh, Kendall Boyne. So it was pretty pretty sweet feeling to win in overtime, and and actually got to start and and really help. Felt like I helped the team um, get there, and then. Uh, that spring were Olympic tryouts. Um, so the way that works is you just go, um, to kind of one location. They invite, I think, 40 some players all there to just try out and try and make, make the uh, Olympic squad. And, and so it's pretty kind of a, a grueling three days where you're just playing games and a couple practices and trying to just show, um, show everything you can to try and make that squad. And, I was fortunate enough to, to do so with Maddie Rooney and, and Alex Rigby. And uh, so from there, we kind of got centralized. We got centralized in Florida in um, August. So we trained there um, up until and played some games against Canada up until um, February when we went when we went to uh, South Korea for the Olympics. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get to play against Russia uh, in the Olympics as well and, and win that game. And um, you know, to be on the ice for the for the gold medal celebration after uh, Maddie Rooney crushed it um, all tournament, and then uh, in the gold medal game to to win it for us. So uh, it was a pretty pretty cool feeling, and just again was just so happy to be in the room with with uh, such a great group of people. And um, 
uh, something obviously I'll never never forget, and and uh, it was such an honor to just to just be at the Olympics and then to to win the gold medal is definitely a dream come true. Um, and then kind of from there, uh, that kind of leads up to this past year. I played my first professional season um, with the Buffalo Buttes um, in the NWHL this past year. Um, had an absolute blast. Uh, Big Little Sports Entertainment. Um, which owned the Butte this past year, um, treated us like absolute professionals and, um, it was, it was such a, such a good time. We had such a good group. Um, and, uh, unfortunately lost to the Whitecaps in the, in the championship game. Um, but, you know, we went on like an 11 and 1 run, I think, the second half of the year. And, and, um, so got to meet a lot of great people up in Buffalo and, um, really enjoyed my time up there, which, yeah, I guess kind of leads, leads into now still still training this summer in St. Louis uh, with three eagle attending with, with Luke Banker and then um, off off ice training with Jeff Lavecchio this summer. So yeah, just trying to trying to work hard and and be ready for the year. Well, uh, <laughs> I guess that kind of sums up a lot of the questions I had. You just kind of led into it yourself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, that's all good. Was uh, playing with Zabados kind of like a like a mentorship type of role for her for you? Yeah, I guess I guess from the from the outside it probably probably looked that way, and and to some extent I I view it that way as well. I I was trying to pick up you know any big things or little things I could from her. She's obviously been around the block a time or two, and um, you know she's the best in the world. So so just to get to learn from her day in day out see how she approaches, you know, goalie sessions or practices or games. And, and I think one of the biggest things I, I got from her was if, when I get scored on in practice, you know, I'll get mad or like frustrated or, you oh, know, oh, some, I, some I know, kind of I know. Yeah. And, and <laughs> I know, you know. <laughs> but, then, but just watching her, it's like, Oh, well, you know, that's fine. And just kind of really let things just roll off her back and, that was really um, eye-opening to me to just see how relaxed and laid back she is um, almost all the time, which, you know, shows, I think, why she's had so much success is um, she's able to let things go very quickly and move on. And I think that that was a great uh, trait that I picked up from her and uh, really, you know, a testament to how she, how she's gotten um, as good and gone as far as she has. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. She's definitely someone really cool to be around just even as a as a student watching how level-headed she is when trying to explain things and her her attitude almost never changes. Yeah, absolutely. And she's always um she she's always like a team first player or a growing growing the game first person. Um uh, I guess is maybe how I would describe it. She's um, one of the least selfish people I've ever seen and, and is always trying to, you know, either make sure the team is, you know, doing whatever's best for the team to succeed or just the game as a whole, trying to do what's best for the game um, and for the future of women's hockey. So going through uh, your work with USA, who are some of the players and goalies in that locker room who really kind of inspired you when you first got there? And uh, maybe some people who kind of took you under their wing um, so I think for me, um, that was definitely, definitely Jessie Vetter was my, at, my, at my first world. Um, you know, she was really great to have and just kind of, I mean, there's a reason she's as good as she is too. She's a lot like, a lot like Dab in the way things just, oh, well, you know, it'll be okay or we'll work it out or, oh, that was a great shot. Hill, great shot. And I'm, I'm glad you scored there. Just, she's someone who's always having fun on the ice, which, um, made me feel a lot more comfortable being being the new kid um so that was that was really really helpful for me in the in the beginning and then uh I was roommates with Alex Rigby at, at almost every camp um when I first when I first started attending the, the USA camp so that was also uh you know super helpful super eye-opening I you know I was like okay she's a, she's a world champion I want to be where she is and she probably got annoyed. You know, I was, I would just kind of, okay, if Riggs is doing this, that's probably a good idea for me to do too. So I'm just going to follow her. I'm sure she's like, why is this kid just following me around? But, um, you know, kind of watching the way she handled herself, um, 
you know, and was so goal oriented at camps and, and things like that, that I was kind of like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to do that too. And, and hope it leads, you know, to the same success for me that it did for her. Uh, as far as some of the players go, I, um, joining them now, I mean, uh, Lee Steckline is basically like team mom. Um, she kind of makes, takes care of all the younger kids and, and so always loved hanging out with her. And then I, uh, just kind of, Became really close with uh, Kelly Panic, Hannah Brandt, um, and and some of the Minnesota girls. I think are kind of some of my some of my closest friends off the team. And then um, during the Olympic year, I lived with Kelly Panic and then and Maddie Rooney. And uh, Maddie Maddie and I, the three of us had a blast. And and Maddie being uh, you know a goalie partner, we we had a we had a blast. And um, you know we try to we kept things pretty light and always joking around and. Maddie always has some fun idea or thought up her sleeve or is, you know, making something crazy in the kitchen. So, um, her and I really hit it off too and, and, uh, got pretty close and just, just, we have a lot of laughs together, which I think, uh, people underestimate how important that stuff is in the grand scheme of things. You know, as a, as a team preparing for something as, as important as the Olympics, um, I think Maddie and I, Try to try to keep it light and loose, and um, having some fun with it as well, which I think uh, you know shows in her play and, and why she's so successful as well. I think that just about wraps up uh, the kind of experiences part of the questions that I had. Kind of transitioning into the uh, off ice side of things. I know Alex Rigsby takes her off ice very seriously, and she's very strict on what she does. Is that something that kind of inspired you to? have the off ice game that you do? Um, yeah, I mean, are you, do you mean like in terms of like strength training and that kind yeah, of stuff? Yeah, just, I, I know like, uh, yeah. when, when she's in the weight room and everything, like she knows exactly what she's doing. She always has a plan going and, uh, I know you're somewhat the same. Yeah. I think, you know, obviously you want to put your best, best foot forward every time you go to a camp or you make a team. So I think, um, a big part of that is preparing off the ice. And so, yeah, I, I definitely take it, take it really serious, take it seri- seriously in the way that when I'm in, in the gym, I'm there to work. It doesn't mean that we don't make it fun every now and then or things like that. But, um, you know, you do, you do have to be strong and in good shape and, and those kind of things to, to be a successful goaltender. So, while you can, while you want to make it fun and have a good time, it's, it's the same thing as on the ice. At the end of the day, you're there to work, and and as long as you're getting that that work in, and you're, you know, on a weekly basis, daily basis, however you look at it, um, you know, that's that's going to help lead to success on the ice. So um, definitely a big motivating factor, you know, when you think about um, being successful on the ice and what you need to do off the ice to, to make sure that happens. So wrapping up the experiences, uh, out of everything that you've done so far, what what has been your favorite memory in uh, your hockey life? Oh man, uh, <laughs> um, I mean, ob- obviously winning a winning a gold medal, just attending the Olympics. I think I think opening ceremonies will forever be um, my favorite sports memory, just because. It's something um, my family watches every single time the Olympics are on, be it summer or winter. We always watch opening ceremonies together, watch the athletes um, come in, always wondering, you know, what's Team USA going to be wearing this time, what's their outfit going to look like. So uh, to actually to actually be one of the athletes in, in that big parade was, it's really hard to describe. It was such a humbling moment and, and at the same time, you're kind of in awe as you walk in with, you know, you're not just walking in with hockey players, you're walking in with skiers, snowboarders, figure skaters, bobsledders, you know, there's all these other people there and they're, you're all on the same team. You're all competing for Team USA. And, and so I think that, that'll probably, probably forever be my favorite uh, sports memory. Yeah, I could only imagine what, what that's like. I, I watch it all the time too, and it's just, it's kind of it's a loss for words on kind of what that would be like. Yeah, it's it's funny because one of my favorite stories is is that we were you know you're in your you're in your little apartment with with your roommates kind of putting on these clothes and you're kind of looking at each other like is this right is this how this is supposed to go like you never think about the athletes feeling kind of 
dorky or weird about putting the outfit on because all you ever see is them all together and looking the exact same. And, and so it was actually kind of funny getting ready for that moment and being, being like, I don't know if this is on right. Are, are we supposed to tie this this way or this way? You know, so there's so no instructions. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. It was kind of, kind of a funny moment leading up to it. So <laughs> yeah, of course. Is, is there any certain player that you've played against that is kind of your rival I know uh, as a goalie, like there's always that one player who always has your number. You always got theirs, and it just kind of stands out from the rest. Is there someone throughout your career or recently on USA that is that rival for you? Yeah, I mean that's tough. Uh, uh, there's so many, so many good players on on all the teams that that we play, and um, I guess uh, Natalie Spooner, uh, Marie Felice Lynn, all of those guys, they're always dangerous. You always have to be alert no matter who's on the ice for, for Canada. So, um, it's, it's hard to pick just one. You, they, they are also skilled and, and talented that, uh, yeah, you, you've got to be aware at all times. Of course. Um, so transitioning into now your gear, <laughs> But uh, just kind of walk us through uh, what you currently have in terms of leg pads, glove blocker, and then just kind of head to toe what you have right now. So skates, I wear uh, one piece true true hockey skates, leg pads, and yeah, my leg pads are the genetic four. My pants are Vons, and that's the extent of my knowledge there. Um <laughs> My chest protector, I actually got used from a kid that um, my goalie coach, Luke, coaches. And because I, I always complain about my chest protectors, and he finally was like, here, just try this on, see how it works. And I've never complained about that chest protector once in my life, so that's, that's what that is. Um, my blocker is uh, Brian's Genetic 4. My glove is a genetic four as well, but I'm currently wearing uh, my genetic three because I like it better. Um, and my helmet is a Warwick that was uh, painted by Seidel Brush Design. My stick is the, I think it's 6.0. Yeah. Uh, true, yeah. The true 6.0. Yep. And then uh, going into depth on your pads, is there anything that you prefer on them? Uh, that you need changed when you order them or are you like a pretty stock pad? Um, overall, I, I think it's pretty stock. I usually, the boot is a little bit softer than the stock pad uh, just so it doesn't take as long to break them in. And then I think I, I have a single brace below the knee and that's, that's the extent of it. Yeah, and then I know you like your gear a lot shorter and that's kind of a... Uh, Something that a lot of people step away from right now is everyone's wanting bigger gear, but I, I've noticed recent trends from certain people that want smaller gear. Is that something you really believe in? Yeah, I think I think every goaltender has to find what they're they're comfortable with. Um, I do think for me, it's definitely a smaller pad because um, one of my greatest skill sets is my skating and my quickness. So. Um, if I have bigger pads on and I feel a little bit bulkier and then they overlap and it just kind of, um, I think it hinders my ability to move as well. Um, so I, I do like a little bit, I guess my, my current pads are 33 plus a half inch, I think. And if I were to order new pads today, I'd probably get a 33 without a thigh rise at all. Oh, geez. Yeah. So you, so you were like the small thigh rise. <laughs> Yeah, well, when I switched to Brian's, I used to wear PCMs, and when I switched to Brian's, they initially said, well, our thigh rise, because I wore a 33 plus 1 in my, I think I, I had the retro spec or whatever. Yeah. From PCM, yeah. So when I switched, they were like, well, our thigh rise is a little taller, so if you were if you were plus 1 with them, you should probably do a plus a half. And that's, that's been fine. I just noticed with the... Um, the genetic fours I had this year that they're, they seem, I don't know, they just seem a little bit taller, which I could totally be imagining and that wouldn't surprise me at all. But, um, I think I, I think I would go down a little bit just 
to even enhance that mobility a little bit more. Yeah, of course. And then uh, going back to your skates, uh, I know that skating is one of your strongest points, like you said. I, I've been able to witness it myself, and that's something that really inspired me personally. Uh, is that something that you really focus on? Um, I think uh, as when I when I first started working with 3E, um, that was a big thing we focused on was how can we nitpick these little things to make you a little bit faster. And so there were a lot of things in the beginning that we we adjusted or we worked on, be it keeping my hips a little bit higher or narrowing out my stance just a bit, things like that. Um, and now I'd say while, yes, I do, there's some sort of skating warm-up and then skating drill every time I get on the ice. Um, it's not it's not like I'm spending 45 minutes out there, you know, just skating without seeing shots. Um, it's kind of we try to work that skating into whatever drill we're doing. That way, you know, because um, I, think, I think one thing sometimes we forget as goaltenders is absolutely, like, 90% of the game is being in the right position so you can make saves for 10% of it. But if you, you could be the best, the absolute best skater in the world, but it doesn't matter how good a skater you are if you can't stop pucks. So it's kind of trying to tie that skating into shooting drills to where you're being challenged a bit if they're shooting early or if they shoot late and it's something where you're sliding so you need to get up or different things like that to, to challenge the skating a little bit more, but still still in a way where you have to be prepared to stop shots. Yeah, it's definitely a, a weird middle ground between being able to stop pucks and skating because, I mean, like you said, you can be the best skater and not be able to stop a puck, but then also you can be one of the worst skaters but be amazing at stopping pucks. Like, it, right. It's a weird middle ground that you got to find an equal – part in to really get the best out of your game yeah absolutely and, and that goes back to, to everybody being different too what works for me as a smaller you know five five six goaltender is going to be different than you know what an nhl guy uses you know so it's just kind of making sure you have a individualized game plan that that works best for you and your abilities and your strengths and weaknesses yeah of course and then uh Kind of wrapping things up, if you had any word of advice for a younger goaltender, what would that be? Ooh, um, I think, I mean, I guess the, the best advice I, I could give was is, is to have fun with it. Um, you know, it, it, that's really what the position is about. If you're so focused on pucks going in the net or I have to make this save, you know, you're, you're going to run yourself into the ground eventually and, and it's just going to burn you out. So I think that's my that would be my biggest thing is, is having to have a short memory and, and have fun with it yeah that's that's great advice that's kind of what ran me into the ground uh some of my last years was i i always went to games with the mentality of oh i have to make this many stops or you know we're not going to win or i'm not going to be happy with myself but uh as soon as i realized that i just needed to uh, have fun my my game amped up quite a bit yeah, absolutely. It's it's goaltender is such a weird position because it's it's so individualized. It's an indiv- individualized position in a team sport, and so I think we get so focused on you know that small piece of blue ice that we forget that there's a lot of other things that go on in the other the other 200 feet. Yeah, of course. And then uh, talking back to your uh, kind of readiness towards a game, is there anything that you have routine wise or any superstitions that you could kind of follow when getting into a game or a practice? Um, I wouldn't say superstitions. I'm not really, not really superstitious, but I do have, you know, my, the routine I've kind of found that works for me is, um, I like getting to the ring pretty early, switching out of my dress clothes very quickly. Um, usually, or not usually, I almost always tape my stick. Um, and then from there, I usually go juggle a soccer ball or play spike ball with, with some teammates. Um, and then from there, I'll kind of do a little bit more of a specific warm-up um, for my hips. And then after that, do the team warm-up and then um, go get dressed. So 
Uh, and then, yeah, I don't, I don't really have any, you know, oh, I tie my left skate first and then my right skate or anything like that. I just kind of kind of put it on um, and actually, went, well, when I get halfway dressed, I usually leave the locker room, um, kind of go take some quiet time to myself. Um, I usually pray during that time just uh, for safety for everyone on the ice for a fun game and, you know, for everyone to go do their do their best. And from there, yeah, I just put the top half on, go on the ice for, um, for warm-ups. I usually like to be one of the last off after after warm-ups and um yeah it's good to good to go from there <laughs> okay so that just about wraps it up thank you so much for talking to us and then uh we'll talk to you sometime soon right yeah no problem thanks for having me Thank you so much again to Nicole Hensley for coming on. If you want to catch her uh, in February 29th to March 1st in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, as part of the PWHPA Dream Gap Tour with uh, skaters such as Kendall Coyne Schofield, Hillary Knight, Sarah Nurse, Mary Philippe Plin, Amanda Kessel, and Natalie Spooner, check that out. They'll be there again February 29th to March 1st in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode of the Outer Roll podcast. Next week, we'll have a baseball podcast. It's Monkey Ball. We'll be talking about the Astros and Red Sox scandal and a little bit of the fallout around that and some other scandals in baseball. So if you're a baseball fan or you know one, be sure to get them subscribed to the Monkey Sports podcast on anywhere you get your podcasts. For the Outer Roll, we'll see you again February 14th. We've got Ev Bomarito from Vaughn Custom Sports to talk about the V9 launch coming up soon and uh, just all things hockey. So we'll see you in about a month. You guys be good.